welcome back to class. Uh, more things for you uh, to learn and to, to be uh, enjoying uh, from this deep learning class. So what I want to start the lesson with, I'd like to start the lesson with a small you know, story. So there was a, an undergraduate some time ago, right? So a few years back, four, I think, in uh, NYU, right? Uh, Aditya Ramesh, which is a friend of mine, uh, who now works at the um, OpenAI, and he made another paper of his, which are just amazing. And I'm going to be sharing with you just a quick, yes, DALI, DALI 2, actually, right? Uh, so perhaps we're going to, I ask him if he want to come here and tell us how this works. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, but let me show you, first of all, what he has done, right? Right. So here, if you go on my profile, right? Uh, you're going to be, if you scroll down, you're going to be seeing this one, right? So uh, this was a generated through like the, the, the prompt was a teapot uh, teaching chemistry to a group of teacups in elementary school while wearing a fancy three, three pieces suit, right? And these are the two uh, generated images generated by the, uh, by the network, right? So this is a generative model, of course. And the Y is going to be uh, this one, right? Well, this is Y tilde, right? The violet Y tilde. Whereas the X is going to be the prompt, the, the observation, the one that is given to the model, right? And so if you scroll down, you're going to be seeing a few more of these. Oops, my bad. If you scroll a little bit down, again, you have like a cute dog playing piano. And you have this one, which is like ridiculously, I think, awesome. I mean, all of them are just amazing, right? A painting of a sad octopus playing the guitar while uh, with seaweed in the background. So much fun. Okay, sorry. Uh, that was the, the prompt. Oh, this one. I think this is just, you know, this is hilariously amazing, right? Bears taking over the planet, right? And I also have a bear, right? So again, uh, <laughs> pun intended. Well, it's not pun, but again, I like bears. Okay, that was a pun. Oh my God, this is a bad joke. Okay, if you don't get the joke, it's even better. Uh, anyway. Bear, bear is taking over the planet, right? By, by Dali. Uh, anyway, so you can scroll, watch. It's so pretty. I think it's amazing. I, I, I actually tagged the, the thing, right? So you have here the post from Aditya. I'll check it out, right? All right. Anyway, enough uh, advertisement. Then we go back to our energy stuff, right? And so a small recap, because again, uh, yesterday we talked about optimization, then I show you a little bit of energy um, arising from moving, uh, like what is the energy profile you observe when you move in the direction of linear interpolation in the ambient space, right? You saw that we have had the two low energies and then you had the kind of bumpy, uh, like a high level energy if you perform linear interpolation in the input space, right? In the, in the ambient space. And so you can see that how the model basically tells you, oh, that thing is garbage, doesn't belong to the training manifold. Therefore, I assign a high energy. Right? And then uh, back last week, we were talking about joint embedding methods, right? So we're going to be uh, restarting from there by, you know, making connecting the dots of all these things we've been talking. I know we have been going back and forth, but I guess uh, it, it should be enough, clear enough, right? So we had, uh, we said we had two different types, major types of architectures, right? We had the first one, which is the latent variable generative energy based model. And then you had the other joint embedding method, right? And then we said that the first one was the one that basically has the uh, Y tilde and the variation in the Y tilde. So we compare that, you know, uh, manifold of Y tildes with the target, blue target. Uh, manifold, right? And how do we get the variation by introducing a additional parameter, the latent variable, right? And then we have the spring and that's the energy. And the energy is going to be the sum of these squares inside the dash box. On the right hand side, instead, we have the joint embedding methods where we're going to have two branches, right? The le uh, left branch and the right branch. Uh, the right branch, basically, uh, we assume that is basically eating away that kind of variability. So there is some sort of uh, uh, what's the word? Invariance, right? Over the variations through the manifold, such that again, you had two points and then you are going to be comparing points, right? You either compare points or you either compare manifolds. You cannot mix the, the thing, right? It's going to be a mess. It doesn't work, right? And this is going to be the energy again, the big box, which has only one box in this case. And that's my F. 
Then I show you so much uh, of these generative models. With Aditya, if he comes, we're going to be seeing one more generative model. So we said there are two different types of training uh, procedures or ways of um, being able to you know, actually train in, all, in order not to have a collapsed model. We either have the contrastive method uh, or the architectural or regularized method. So what are the differences? What are, again, we have really seen this so many times, but you know, uh, repetita juvent, it's Latin means repeating helps. Meaning I just keep repeating myself. It's all good. So training, how do we train this stuff, right? So we would like to find a energy such that the energy for the observed uh, pairs or just targets, if we don't have the X, is going to be lower than the energy for the non-observed one, right? So that, that's the, basically what we'd like to do. So if we have those targets over there, we'd like to have a energy which is going to be low for the observed uh, dots, higher otherwise, right? Uh, how to do that? Two options. You either have the contrastive technique, you push down the energy on the things that you observe and you pull up on the locations uh, that are specifically, you know, choose locations that are not the blue locations and you pull up the energy. Or the, the, other, ter the other option, which is uh, like in this case, the architectural case, where, where we, uh, we, we confine the region of, you know, low energy space to be a, you know, let's say in this case, one dimensional manifold, right? It's a curved, still one dimension manifold embedded in this two dimensional ambient uh, space, right? Or you have the regularization term, right? Which is like a soft constraint. So I think you can usually think about the architectural as like a hard type of, you know, uh, constraint and the regularize is some sort of, you know, softer, like springy thing, okay? Um, there are different techniques. I don't want to repeat that. I may try to give you one example of these uh, joint embedding methods, right? So I, I just try to give it my, my, my view and then we're going to have Judge and making the whole thing very clear, right? So joint embedding methods, contrastive clustering, distillation, you have so many options. Uh, we will know more. So you have many, many, many options. There are many uh, weird things we might or might not talk about, right? So there are so many things and more stuff here on the other side, right? So there are, you can, as you can tell, there are like several options uh, available for you to be, to use, right? To try. And each of these have uh, pros and cons, right? The one that is uh, the simplest to explain for you is the one that doesn't have these kind of uh, aqua boxes, right? It's gonna be the left-hand side, which is, you know, the most simple type of architecture. So, the one I would like to, to, to introduce to you to, today is going to be this VicRag, no? So this VicRag has these two branches, the left branch and the right branch. And then it has several costs on top of these two branches. We actually figured that this drawing is incorrect because some of these boxes need to be a different color. And since they are not part of the energy, but they're going to be part of the loss, right? So it's actually not... Uh, I, I will have to update these uh, drawings. So how does this VicRec work, right? So first of all, we can talk about this E here. I'm going to be called this E for embedding. Uh, we may use, we may prefer to use a different letter such that we don't get confused with the energy, okay? So let's think uh, at the moment uh, about these letters and these terms, okay? So the E is going to be the representation of a input batch X, right? So X is going to be a batch in this case. And E is going to be the representation of the whole batch of axes. Same for the Y, right? The EY is going to be the representation for the batch of Ys. So my E is going to be a batch dimension times the D dimensions, okay? Whatever is going to be this internal dimension. Each column, right, of this matrix is going to be of B items, okay? So each item, each, each column of this matrix has B items. And then each row of this matrix is going to have, well, D items, right? You, you, you see this, right? So what these two things are doing is going to be the first one is going to have this similarity cost, right? So, well, this similarity cost. So 
we're going to be basically trying to get these two representation to be close together, right? But if we just do that, we know that the model can simply come up with the constant solution. And so we have to introduce two additional terms, which I'm going to be just introducing. And then again, I will just leave you judging for uh, to explain this more concretely. But the so I just wanted to introduce this different perspective uh, for the same thing. So again, if we just minimize the distance between these two items, we're going to be getting a constant representation because that's the easiest way to get two things to be the same, right? So we need to introduce two more items down here. So the first one, this V, basically, will keep the vari the, the, these vectors here for having a constant representation across the batch. So this variance term will try to bump up the variations of these representations throughout the batch. And then we have another term, which is this C term, which is going to be trying to get each of these representation independent, such that it is maximally uh, informative. Why is that necessary? You, it may, you, I would say perhaps the C term is not really strictly necessary. You need a V term, which is basically having a different term for all of this. But then if you try to decorrelate each of these items, you're going to have some representation that are basically aligned to the axis. Again, the major point is going to be the S allows me to have similar representation for the two branches. The easiest way to cheat would be having a constant representation for us throughout, you know, every time. And so this V term instead will enforce the variance across the batch to be some specific value. How to do that? We have this hinge loss. This component here is computing the variance for these ED vectors. And then, as you can see here, if we try to minimize this term, since there is a minus here, we're going to be trying to push up this variance. Until when? Until we get up to this threshold here. And then there's going to be like a positive part. So we're not going to be pushing more than the threshold here. And so this variant, variance term here, will make sure that the variance stays above this gamma. If this thing is below gamma, then when you train the, the, the system, you want to try to minimize the loss. You know, this term here will try to grow right? until when? Until when it becomes equal to gamma, right? If this is larger than gamma, the whole thing is going to be negative. The positive part keeps, kills it, right? OK, that was all I wanted to say. And I took exactly 15 minutes. So what is E-circle? E E-circle, I didn't say, but I know I, I was just going to introduce this lesson. But again, I will tell you. E-circle is my centered uh, embedding. Okay, What does it mean, centered? Will, it simply means that E matrix to which I subtract the mean of each, like the mean, the mean row, right? So the right-hand side of this expression here computes the mean row, right? EB is the given row. Here I sum all the B rows and I divide it by B. So this is the average row and I get my matrix and I subtract the average row such that the column now are zero mean. Therefore, if I compute the square length of the column, you're going to get the variance. Okay. Again, I didn't want to really go into the detail. I just wanted to show you that this architecture doesn't require, because you're going to hear now from Jachen that all these ar other architecture I showed you before, this eight I showed you before, they all introduce so many fancy things. This is the most simple to understand. We kind of understand, right? Questions? For the C, uh, the C basically, uh, what I'm <coughs> showing here, here I, com I compute the, uh, the sum of all the um, squares of the uh, covariance matrix, and I subtract the diagonal such that by minimizing this term, I minimize all the cross terms in the uh, covariance matrix. Okay. 
So this C term basically decorrelates the uh, vectors EDs. Okay, again, not too important. The V is the most important, I would say. Okay, so V just tries to boost up the variance for each individual dimension. The C tries to make those dimensions independent. Okay, I took enough time. So the rest is going to be judging, trying to make some order and try to give you some more, you know, deeper perspective of all this stuff. I'm done for the day. I will be answering, well, I will ask Jachin's questions about the uh, content he's going to be talking to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, let's have a really quick recap. What did we talk about last uh, Thursday? So the first, we talk about the visual representation learning, like uh, how it's a two-step process. You do per training first, then you do evaluation, uh, like a, a second step. Then we talk about uh, how can you do visual representation learning? You got a generative method that per uh, protects a task or joint embedding method. So, and uh, we, we're mainly going to talk about the joint embedding method and how like they have two properties, like the intuition. The first intuition is uh, we, the representation should be invariant to data limitation. Then, but then it will like uh, cause a trivial solution. So we then will introduce some method like uh, how to we, how, how can we prevent the trivial solution? And the one way we can do it is through the contrastive method. Basically, you push all the negative pair, uh, all the positive pair closer and all the negative pair apart. But so like how you found the negative pair, you get two strategy. All the old uh, papers, they kind of use this hard negative mining strategy. We didn't really talk about it much. So it's just like it just uh, found the use some prior knowledge to find negative samples. Then I introduced like a more mordant. Most of the paper use is like have a large negative sample pool. I don't want to use the batch because uh, Jan, he actually talk about like a, what's the difference between batch and the pool. So, but anyway, we have a so we want to have a like have a large negative sample pool so we can pick. So in by chance we will have a some sample uh, like a like it's really hard hard some negative samples are really hard so then i think i, I mentioned it, like how simclear did it and how moco did it so that's uh, the recap so this time we're going to talk about this uh, non-contrasting method basically you try to prevent the trivial solution without using any negative samples so why we want to do it because Apart from like all oh, Young and Alfredo talk a, a lot about like the disadvantage of a contrastive method, like uh, in reality, in practice, actually people found out the contrastive method actually need a lot setup to make it work. So like there's just a bunch of examples you you sh you need to have those like uh, some at least some of those to make this contrastive method works. So in practice, it's actually. Uh, introduce a lot of engineering tricks actually make it really hard to analyze uh, like in, in theory like how it works so also it's like sometimes it's really not stable if you don't use those and so so then there's a bunch of method introduced those are non contrastive method they introduced based on like uh, some information theory says oh the representation should have a shouldn't have much redundancy. It's called redundancy reduction. So like a bottle turns, or the information content of the representation should be the maximum. You should maximize the information content of the representation. So it's a big crack. And uh, so the, the, the advantage of those, uh, those two methods and some other methods, the TCR and the, like I won't mention them, but uh, they are they are kind of nice because they don't require much special architectures. You basically can train with uh, like some like some basic uh, setup. Yeah, you don't have to have uh, too much engineering tricks. So then I will, today I would mostly introduce VCrack like uh, about this. Uh, so VCrack based on this information maximization like a principle. Basically, you want you. Uh, you want your representation have the maximum information about your image because a trivial solution means for no matter which image you have, you will have the same representation. Then it means the representation 
means the representation contain no information content about the image. So you want to maximize the information content. So how you do it? You, you try to produce embedding variables that decorrelate from each other. Because if all the variables, they're, all the variables they, if they correlate to each other, they like a covariate together. So you, 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 like a, you will, like the information content is like reduced, right? Because it, yeah, if you have a two independent variable, the information content will be higher than the two variable. They are covariate each other. So this then- is, This is what the C term was doing in the yeah. slide I showed before, right? Yeah. Then like a third thing is like, a, then eventually you basically prevent this informational collapse, which the variable just carry redundant information. Okay, so you see you have a two collapse. One collapse you like for no matter what image you have, you always generate the same uh, representation. That's a trivial solution we talked about like uh, last uh, Thursday. So now for VCRAG, you have a special type of collapse. Basically all the representation just to carry really limited amount of information. So although different images have a different representation, but uh, the information content is really low in each representation. So how they do it, they basically, Alfredo already introduced uh, the loss function for VCRAG. So you basically have, a, uh, you have three terms. The first term is like, a, is like a, it's the same for all the other methods. It's like you just push the negative, uh, the positive pair closer to each other. Then the second thing is you try to push the covariance matrix. You can, you can calculate the covariance matrix like this. And so you try to, the diagonal term of a covariance matrix is just variance for each vector. You want the variance to be high because if the variance, like for trivial solution, the variance for each term is just zero, right? So, so, so this one actually prevent this first type of a trivial solution, right? You want the variance for each term to be high. But then you, but then you will have the issue, like all the, all the elements, they covariate to each other. So you have the second type of a trivial solution. Then you use a third, third, a third term loss function, like a, to make the covariance of the embeddings small. So you get all the off diagonal term of the covariance matrix and try to push them small because the off diagonal term could be negative or positive. So you add a, like a square here. So, so you push all the off diagonal terms small. So you see there's a, there, there's instead of a two step, you have a three step. So the you, this one is the environment to data augmentation. Then it have this a trivial solution, like t the first type of trivial solution. Then you push the variance high. Then it prevent the first type of trivial solution, but it introduce the second type of trivial solution. Then you push the covariance to be low. So then it is solve the second type of trivial solution. Okay, so that's basically the intuition about the VCRAG. And uh, so I think Daniel asked a question says, oh, maybe it's uh, like, a, it's a, why not it's just, a, it's like, a, maybe it's just a clever way to make, a, to, to use a negative samples instead of directly like repel them, but you, you calculate the covariance matrix or something. But actually here, uh, like there, yeah, like a, it's actually a legit argument, but here, like in practice, people observe actually the the requirement for batch sizes is much smaller because uh, uh, like you you still need a, a a batch of the samples. Why? Because you need estimate the covariance matrix. You cannot estimate the covariance matrix by just have one samples. So, but uh, like like a uh, like a uh, but uh, the estimation doesn't require that the covariance matrix is easy to estimate. So it's the estimation does not require too much samples. So just from the, like the empirical result, it seems it doesn't require as much of the negative samples as also contrastive method. So in some sense, you can see it's like a smarter contrastive method, but in general, like the integration wise, people just think it like it's a non-contrastive method, yeah. So, any question? I saw. No, everyone is just really happy because your your explanation is just perfect. We like it. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> then, okay. So that's a like one category non-contrastive method based on information theory. Okay. 
So there's another category of really interesting non-contrasted method. It's called clustering methods. So, uh, like a, so basically, it try to prevent the trivial solution by quantizing the embedding space. And uh, so it's actually not have too many methods. I think in total, there's only as as far as I know, only one group work on this stuff. Although they publish like four or five different papers, like about this clustering method. But uh, yeah, but it's a kind of out of fashion. But it's really interesting, and so I would like to introduce it. So you get this really complex graph. Let's let's dig it the mean. So you get a one image, another image, and like a, sorry, the same image but two D sort of version X and Y. You generate the representation, then you can stack them up to to like as a as we did for all the other method. You get n of them, then you stack up. You gen you basically get this n by d matrix, the uppercase H X and H Y. Okay, so then you do a clustering. So you do two clustering method. The first one you use this Sinkhorn algorithm. So this Sinkhorn algorithm, I will I will talk about it a little bit about it later. But uh, you get one clustering method, like one clustering assignment. So you get n. So k is the number of cluster. So you get n by k. Let's uh, this is the Q matrix. So in, in the extreme case, we can let, let's let's just think of uh, in reality it's a continuous. But here let's just think about this one hot. So so for each row, only one element is one other, all other element is zero, okay? So you get n of them uh, each, for each image. Then you can do a, another clustering. This one, I, I name it as soft the k-means, but uh, actually it's not really soft k-means, but you will, you will know what, like why I call it soft k-means. So this one, you do a clustering again with the same centroid. So you will generate the prediction. Oh, sorry, it's actually here, okay? So you use Y, and you do a solve k-means, and you generate a Q the prediction, Q tilde tilde K, Q tilde x. So that's a prediction for this Q x. So this is uh, uppercase Q x. So then you use basically you use H Y to predict the clustering of H Q x, and you use H x to predict the, uh, the clustering of QY. So that's why it's called swap, swap because that's swap prediction. Okay. There's a okay. question here. How do you use a vector to predict a clustering? Okay. No, no, it's a, you, you mean here, right? I don't know, I'm, uh, asking, I'm okay. reading the question. <laughs> okay, okay, let, let, let me explain again. Okay. Uh, oh, maybe it's easier to, ch let's check the loss function together mm -hmm. so you will understand. Sure. Okay. So. Let's see, this W is over centroid. So this one is uh, basically K by D is over centroid. And H, this HX is uh, N by K. So this is Sinkhorn algorithm is uh, 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 like, a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like, let's say if you do K-means, if you do K-means, like uh, sometimes you will have this uh, weird thing happened. Basically all the, all the samples being clustered to one, one like a one centroid, like a lot of sample close to one centroid, and other centroid have no no samples at all. So this sinkhorn basically is the algorithm like it can prevent such thing from happening. So it actually will almost equally distribute the samples to not just to one cluster but to every cluster to make sure every cluster at least have a certain some some number of samples. So that's a they actually a hyperparameter you can tune in a sync form. and uh, depends on this uh, the hyperparameter. So you can have like a completely like a k-means or completely equally distributed like a clustering. So then you basically after generate that you get this qx that's an assignment and the qx basically equal to like for each for each input let's say for x one you get this k dimensional vector basically tell you uh, which centroid is uh, close to. And let, let's treat it as one hot. So those, all those are one hot. Okay, tell you which uh, centroid is, uh, is uh, this sinkhorn assigned. So that's uh, the top, that's the top branch. For the bottom branch, you basically do this thing called, I call like a soft uh, k-means. 
what is happening is you got a centroid and you got HY, you multiply them for, for, for this D dimensional, for this particular image Y, and you multiply, okay, if, I forgot to mention, this HY is actually normalized. So, so basically W times HY is time HY, the, the similarity between HY and all other centroids. Then you apply a softmax on that. So you will get uh, this, uh, so you basically, like, like if you, you do not use a soft argmax, you use argmax. So that's exactly the k-means. It'll tell you, okay, which central are close to the samples. But if you use softmax, soft argmax, you basically found the, the softer version of which, uh, which central are close to the samples. Okay, so you get this, uh, so, but uh, you see this is hy, but you actually do a prediction for qx. So, so that's why it's a swap. So you can, if you make this here is hx, so you get a qy, okay? Then the energy function is uh, simple. It's just a cross entropy between this uh, one hot vector and this uh, you make the, the prediction you make. So, okay, so let's, let's study two things about the joint embedding method. Why it's not, why, why it will push uh, uh, like an environment to data augmentation, okay? The, the reason is you basically try to assign uh, the, because here the Q, QX is generated by HX and this uh, tilde QX is generated by HY. So you basically try to assign both HX and HY to the same cluster. So instead of pushing directly, directly pushing those two to be close to each other, you actually push them to the to be the to be inside the same cluster. So that's a, that's a that's a like a, a different way to make sure their environment to data augmentation. Yeah. Hold on, how can we interpret this? So what are these clusters, right? So we can think about this like yesterday we were talking about the mm -hmm. uh, when we apply like a variational autoencoder over mm -hmm. the digits of the MNIST data set, right? So yeah. we can think as oh, the latent space gets partitioned in perhaps, hopefully, 10 different buckets. We are not providing labels to our yeah. algorithms. But automatically, if the network or the algorithm needs to come up with a specific number of clusters, it could happen that these clusters will uh, be somehow connected to the actual classes of the individual items, right? So although we don't have the label information, we can expect the overall algorithm to come up with this, you know, subdivision of the data based on these classes that are extracted from the data. So later on, we can just, you know, train uh, supervised with very, uh, very few examples, right? Very few annotations. If we come up with 10, uh, 10 buckets, 10 different clusters for, let's say, the uh, MNIST data set, then later on, we just need, for example, 10 data points to assign each cluster to the corresponding target, right? So that, that's how this clustering can basically be connected to the actual, you know, downstream task later on. Yeah. Okay. I saw two questions in the yes. chat, so maybe I should answer. How is swapping going to help? Okay. So, so the thing is, if you do not, if you don't swap, so you basically, uh, you use the KHX to predict the QX, but the QX actually generate from HX. So the solution actually trivial. So you want you actually want the HX, you actually want to use HY to predict QX because the QX is generated by HX. So, so the, 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 as I explained before, so the swapping basically enforce the HX and HY, they being clustered into the same class, class. But if you do not do swap, you only enforce HX and HX to HS and HX itself to be clustered into the same class. So that's why that that doesn't help. It doesn't help the environment to the data augmentation. Okay. So there's another question is uh, why softmax W HX equal to QX? Okay. Let me let me give you a simple example. Let's say K is just a two. So so the W is a two by D matrix. So you get a two. So you basically only have a two centroid. So if you W times HY, so you basically have each centroid 
mod uh, two uh, W sorry W is a two by D and H Y is a D. So you basically get a vector of a size of two, and each element is a cosine distance between uh, uh sorry cosine similarity between H Y and the corresponding centroid. So then you basically apply a soft argmax to turn turn that uh, cosine similarity because the cosine theorem could be negative or positive into a probability, categorical probability. So that's why Q tilde X. Okay. So there's another question. So you would want to the number of classes to be the close to the number of classes as possible. Uh, not necessarily actually, because, uh, okay, in the SWA paper, I think they use 8,000 classes, even for ImageNet. ImageNet only have a thousand class, like, a, but for clustering, they have 8,000 classes. So you can imagine that you you can you can think of it as that even even you have one if like if uh, for all the image of the dogs you can still sub divide them and uh, so like uh, there's uh, like uh, you can divide them into different type of dogs based on this texture of the this the, the skin texture or whether the color or like uh, they're big dog or small dogs so. Actually, if you can subdivide each class even more, that's actually help. That's actually provide actual information about your like uh, uh, about the uh, the representation space. You actually want to divide it more, even though you may not need it, but the divide it more may help you train. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. I think that's all the questions. So. Okay. Let's let's. Uh, yeah, so that's how it prevent. I, I just talk about how it prevent the uh, no, sorry, how it push to the environment of the data augmentation. But I haven't talked about how it prevent the trivial solution, like uh, because the trivial solution exactly prevented by this single horn algorithm. So because it uh, it when it when the single horn do the clustering, it actually dis try to make all the all the different samples into a uh, different classes have a equal amount of uh, samples. So in that case, you cannot put all the sample into one corresponding to one centroid. So in that sense, you actually make the, make the, like, uh, the representation space uh, like, uh, not too close to each other because uh, if, it, if you make all the, uh, like, uh, if you make all the sample, it, because in the trivial solution, you basically make all the representation as the same. So in that case, the sync in that case the sync horn actually prevented because uh, because you try to push all the representation close to each centroid, but uh, uh, but uh, okay, I, let me let me rephrase it, yeah, Be because you try to you, you essentially make the all the centroid really far away from each other, so you then you cannot make all the representation to be the same. Because if you make the representation to be same, that makes the this cross entropy impossible to predict, right? Because all the representation is same, and it's a like a uh, it, 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 the the like a, the the synchron clustering will be really random, right? Because uh, you do not see the difference between each images. That's how it prevents the collapses. Okay, hopefully I make some sense. Okay, is the synchron soft? Okay. Uh, yeah, let me answer that. So, yeah, yeah, Sinkhorn is solved. Actually, in the particularly in the SWAT paper, they actually mentioned that they tried the hard version and the soft version. So, and they say if uh, like like in conclusion, is the soft version actually better works better, but the hard version also works. But uh, because of the harder version, like uh, the intuition, are easier to understand. So I choose to use the harder version. Is is this why we are using batch variable for H X and H Y? Yeah, for Singhorn, if you want to do classification uh, clustering, unlike K means for K means, you 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 don't have to know all other samples because you just need to know the centroid and the samples you are at. So you just calculate the distance between all the centroid that you get the clustering. But for Singhorn, because you want to equal number of samples in every classes. So you actually have to know the the HX. You basically have to the uppercase HX. You have to know the other samples clustering. So 
That's why we use HX, the uppercase HX here, not the, the lowercase HX. For swap, K, yeah, K is a hyperparameter you can tune. But yeah, I think in the paper, they just use 8,000. I still feel, no, H cannot be zero because H is normalized. H is uh, fixed to be univector. I think I mentioned it, but maybe, yeah. The QX and the Q, uh, to the QX, actually you can swap. There's a, another, another, uh, another like a symmetrical, like a loss uh, energy function. Basically you get HY and the QY. Here you get HX and the Q to the Y. So the actually that's why I only write half of the loss function. So the last line, I think we should have written the F equal to yeah. two C's, right? C yeah, yeah, yeah. QXX yeah. plus C Q Y Y, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You actually have that. So in the graph, you have a two C. Yeah. So that's why. Okay. <laughs> My bad, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So like, uh, okay. So that's a clustering method. So the last one is called like a I I call it other method. So why we call it other method? Because we do not really understand why it works. At least there's some uh, theoretical uh, study about those methods, but we have a, we still do not know why they do not collapse to trivial solutions. So okay, so those are the early example is actually bio. So what happened to bio is uh, is uh, you you do not need uh, okay you, you okay let let, let, let let me explain it first. You got the input X. And the uh, and the input y as the same as the old one. Like uh, you got two distorted version, you got the two representation. But instead of just use a d, uh, you can just change it to predictor. Uh, it, sorry, you added the predictor. So you basically so in the original paper they say oh it's a, we call it the predictor because they try to use hx to predict the hy. And this law uh, this energy function is just a Euclidean distance. Uh, sorry, it's like a cosine. Actually, it's cosine similarity between the predict H, H, Y, and H, Y. So uh, you cut the gradient, but uh, there's no term to prevent it collapse. So if you remember uh, our graph for contrastive method, we have this box N and we say, oh, you, you sample a batch and this batch thing, we need, uh, we need uh, in, at least enforce a certain thing to happen. But here you only push the positive pair closer you do not push the negative pair or you do not enforce anything, but it still works. So why it works, uh, like there's a bunch of theory, like maybe related to batch norm and uh, some says, oh, it's not related to batch norm. And uh, there's a lot of theory about that, but uh, apparently this uh, asymmetrical architecture, which actually actual layers works in this uh, particular case. And the same thing is the follow-up paper on bio. The only difference is bio use this momentum backbone, but the same same just uh, same same just use a regular backbone. But uh, okay, then we have this Dino method. So the Dino method uh, is uh, even weirder. So it's a uh, actually just backbone and the momentum backbone. Uh, okay, so you get a two representation, and you go through this self argmax and the self. Uh, Argmax. The only difference is the two soft argmax have a different temperature or coldness, like a, like our field we use the different coldness. So then you do a cross entropy between those two. You basically push these two together. Still, there's no negative samples or anything, and it still works. So the last one is like a really recent paper called Data to Back, and uh, so. It, it, uh, it actually just add a layer norm at the end of this representation and it works. So for all these reasons why it works, we are not quite sure. And, uh, but it's interesting because it means we may, there, there's probably some uh, implicit regularization happening for those network to prevent them from uh, like a converge to this, uh, to this trivial solution. So, and uh, all, all those methods are really nice because the loss function are really local. You only need HX, you only need HX and HY to calculate the loss function. But for all the previous method, you, no matter VCRAG or like uh, all the contrasting method, you actually uh, a batch of a, a pool of uh, negative samples or a pool of uh, samples. 
So it actually caused a problem when you do distributed training because in distributed training, you have to do this uh, collection to collect the, all the vectors from different devices. So, so, this, so that's why a lot of people actually focus on trying to figure out how those uh, other methods, which like do not prevent to trivial solution, and in what condition they like they converge to trivial solution. Okay, so I saw there's uh, some question. Uh, okay, I think it, it will work, but maybe converge slower. Uh, actually, no. Like uh, they actually. Okay, so first of all, for all the for all the drawing embedding method, actually convergence is kind of low, kind of slow. So there's the other method not a particular slower than other, like a contrasting method or other, like a like a v crack or v crack. So that that's a, that, so that's why I said that's why it's there's some like a in implicit regularization happening. So to make them do not converge to like there's a trivial solution. Okay. So what is the connection with the contrastive learning? Yeah, like uh, a lot of people think uh, for, especially for the bio, bio terms. So maybe you can re actually, uh, like if you, if this particular, particular, if this is just a linear predictor, you actually can wrote the update function for this predictor. And you found that you can find out actually is do some implicit uh, negative sample contrast uh, contrasting thing. So, but uh, when it uh, really complicated like this, uh, if, if you just make it uh, three or four layers uh, feed forward network, then it's uh, almost impossible to analyze. But those uh, those three or four layer feed forward actually works better, much better than just a linear predictor. Yeah. So. What if you initialize to give a trivial solution? Yeah, uh, yeah, if you, okay, here's, if you initialize a neural network to give a trivial solution, then those network will never work. Why? Because, because if you already had a trivial solution, then those loss function will produce zero gradient. So it means if it get into the trivial solution and it can never escape from the trivial solution. However, for whatever reason, it just the training dynamic never really converged to the trivial solution. So that's uh, the the thing we're not sure why it happened. In data to wag, it's necessary to go after the batch with the add the layer norm after the batch branch with the uh, I to go after the branch with the layer after the. Or if you, okay, if you add a layer norm here, I'm actually never tried the data to work to add another layer norm here, but it, maybe you can try it for your project to see whether it works or not. Yeah. Uh, is there any good papers uh, for like try to figure out what the implicit regulation are? Uh, I saw some, uh, like some papers, but uh, none of them are like really give you satisfying explanation. So it's like a really active research. Like for, for data to work, it actually came up like the, maybe three months ago. So like all those uh, things are still relatively, like super new. So we are not sure like what happened. Yeah. So yes. So, okay, there's a question about swap. Swap seems very similar to the contrastive method. It is like instead of using everything in the batch, as a negative pair, it uses those other cluster as negative pairs. Why is it not uh, contrasted? Okay, yeah. I mean, you can, it, it's a really, it just depends on how you view. Okay, let, let me, let me, let me, let me actually stress on this, uh, this point. So, so first swap, yeah, you can absolutely think instead of a contrast to a negative samples, you just contrast to the negative centroid. You can you can absolutely think of that, but to think of that is not necessarily help help you to understand what happening. Like you can because uh, the contrastive learning explanation is not really theoretical satisfying because uh, you just told me okay I want to push negative pair apart, but you do not tell me wh who, who what is a good negative pair and how 
how you can how how you can how how you should use them and uh, whatever. So you can you basically can like uh, you can think of them as a uh, contrastive learning, but actually think of them like a regularization, like it means giving you better explanation. Like say you quantize the embedding space into this uh, uh, k number of a uh, 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 subspace, and it actually make it make it easier to understand. And uh, so, yeah, and uh, maybe that explanation actually help you to develop more algorithm. So that's why people more uh, tend to think of those uh, non-contrasting methods. Yeah. Okay, so. So, okay, just uh, all those other methods don't have any regularization still. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. All the other methods, they do not uh, have uh, like uh, any regularization. And they still don't produce trivial solution. Yeah. And uh, like, but uh, they're quite sensitive on the setup, on the hyperparameter. If you set the hyperparameter wrong, like uh, it may convert to trivial solution. And it will converge really fast to trivial solution. However, for as if you set the hyperparameter correct, and uh, so it will not convert to trivial solution, but no one understand why. Yeah. Okay, so that's all about the all the method. So the next next thing I would like to talk about is about data augmentation and network architecture. So uh, let's say uh, I will like be really brave about it because we do not have a really good understanding about the, those and. Uh, but they are actually super important if you can find a good augmentation. Like usually, it maybe even boosts more performance than accuracy than just to change the loss function. Sometimes the loss function doesn't really matter that much. It's mostly just to provide you uh, understanding what you master, like how it works. But actually, data augmentation and network architecture sometimes are more important. Like if you only care about the accuracy, they're actually more important in some sense, okay? So for the data augmentation, usually people like, a, let's say like a, from 2020 to 2021, people just like the most dominant augmentation is by proposed by SimClear and they improve a little bit by bio. So you basically do, a, for you give an image, you do random crop, and then you flip it, horizontal flip it, then you do some color jitter, basically change the color, or make it a grayscale, like a change of contrast or like the brightness, then you could do a Gaussian blur and make the image blurry. So that's, that's the, what the, the standard data augmentation method for, like for, for, the, uh, like a, like a for all the same clear MoCo, like a bio, whatever. So, and uh, if you know, okay, sorry. If you know something about the data augmentation in supervised learning, those data augmentation are actually super strong. They're like a crazily large number of uh, data augmentation. Like in, if you, in regular supervised learning, now, now people devise some mixed uh, max or some, some, some data augmentation, but uh, your people in supervised learning, they just use random crop and color jitter. And uh, the color jitter is not even that aggressive. Okay. So, Okay, so so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is actually if you people try to remove all of them and see what the, the effect, and uh, almost always you find out the random crop is the most critical one. If you do not have a random crop, even you have the flipping color jitter Gaussian blur, it will, it will, the the representation will be horrible. But if you even if you only have a random crop and you do some s smart engineering tricks. The, the, the same works. So like uh, why the random crop is the, the, the most uh, critical one, we're not quite sure, but uh, there's uh, some, uh, like uh, at least there's some understanding about it because uh, maybe the random crop is uh, the only way uh, we can, like uh, the only way we can remove, like uh, to change the spatial information about the images. So the, all the others, like maybe Flip can do it, but the Flip is like really weak. Like for color jitter or Gaussian blur, it's more like changing the, uh, the channels, uh, like a representation, okay? So, and then now actually since from uh, maybe uh, June of last year, so people try to from the traditional augmentation to this masking augmentation. 
So, so let's say you get the image and you mask out this, a lot of patches. Actually here, you mask out about 75% of the patches. And then that's you, that's your data augmentation. You do not use color jitter or Gaussian blur or flip. So this one actually works pretty well. But there's two issues. The first of all, it only works with a transformer type of architecture. Doesn't quite work with a confident. So a, a lot of, I know a lot of people, including me actually, we are trying to work out like how to make the masking work in combinat. Okay. So the second thing is the success, success of this thing actually replace the random crop. So in some sense, so we do not need a random, uh, like a, it's another way to remove the spatial information, like or like remove the redundancy of the spatial information. So that's a that's a really still in active research about how to do the masking. Yeah, and that's about the data augmentation. And for let, let me let me check questions. Why does it work? Okay, but it does work because okay. So to in short, it basically. If you use the combnet, it it reintroduces too much random, uh, too much edges, right? You see, it have uh, so much uh, artificial edges, but if you have a transformer, you do not need to care about those edges because for all the, uh, like a, you because you just do, because okay for any transformer, the first layer is the comb layer, okay? So when you do the comb layer, you basically do the kernel size equal to the stride. And not only equal to the stride, it's also equal to the patch size. So in that case, you you never you never experience these artificial edges because you already set the edges. But in the combinat, you you cannot do that because you have these sliding windows. Even even you do it smartly in one layer, in first layer, you you do not make the sliding window to see those artificial edges. But in the next layer, you, you, you have no choice. You will see the, those artificial edges. So I think that's uh, the main reason why the masking doesn't work for combinat, but work for like a transformers, okay? So, okay, yeah. So then, then the, for the network architecture, so, it's also we do not know much, but uh, something we definitely know from the empirical result. It says, first of all, it's always better to add a projector after the backbone, and so the projector only used during the pre-training. Uh, when you do the evaluation of the downstream tax, you just remove the projector, you just uh, throw away, and only use the backbone. And uh, sometimes people call it projector, sometimes it's spender. So projector project to lower dimensional and the expander project to higher dimensional. So like for contrastive learning, you have no choice. You can only use the projector because they're, like they're young explained like how the negative samples happen. But, the, but for all the VCRAG, those methods, you can use it. You can use the expander or the projector. So, so that's uh, the same. So the second thing is after after the MoCo, like uh, both use the momentum encoder and the memory bank, it's actually people found out even you do not use memory bank, you just use the momentum encoder. Actually, it still improve the performance of a downstream task, especially when you only have weak data augmentation. So that's the case I talk about when you only have a data augmentation like only have a random crop. You don't have this thing. You don't have a color jitter or Gaussian blur. And if you do not use the momentum encoder, actually the network will learn horrible representation. But if you use the momentum encoder with this simple data augmentation, random crop only, it just still works. And it actually works. Uh, it's a, definitely not state of art, but it's actually close to state of art. So the performance doesn't decrease much. So why this momentum encoder helps, we are still not sure. So some people think it's added some uh, actual augmentation. You can, yeah, you can think it that way. And uh, what is a projector? Okay, sorry. projector is just a neural network. You can do two, it's a, usually just a two or three layer fade forward network. So yeah, instead of just use the representation uh, from the backbone, 
you actually get the representation from backbone, it's a vector, and you go through this uh, two or three layer fade forward uh, network. And then you, you use the output of projector to calculate your loss function or energy function. Yeah. So why are we removed? Okay, because, uh, okay, for contrastive learning, the, uh, why, okay, the question is why are we remove the projector during the evaluation? Okay, for, for contrastive learning, there's a good reason why we do that. It's uh, because the output of the backbone is like a 200, uh, sorry, 2048 yearly or 4,000 something. And then the output projector is usually 128 or 256. So it's really small. If you downstream task only based on this uh, 256, uh, output, so it's actually not uh, too good. So you want uh, your vector, you, because this projector remove a lot of information. So you actually you want to use the larger vectors, and for other other type of uh, like uh, architecture like VCRAG and something. So actually, there's a paper from Pascal Vincent group, like they're from University of Toronto. I don't put it here, but uh, they found out that for VCRAG, even you make the projector dimensional, same size as the dimensional for the output. So the output projector and the output backbone is the same size. And uh, you will find out actually the output of, of the backbone contained more information about the image and uh, the output projector get less information about the image. So it's a projector kind of like remove a lot of information from the backbone representation. So it is still is not a really there's no like a concrete explanation why it happened, but the, that's a basically people just show it empirically it works better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's the time. So. Okay. So, and uh, you can, if you have a more question, you can ask. Otherwise, you can we can just say the class up. Yeah. So, I think okay. we can take the last two questions now. And okay. Yeah. yeah. I think it was just great. I mean, I love this lesson. Um, yeah. In the style, I saw that the reference paper at the bottom is the title. Yeah. Okay. And for this particular reference, it's actually about uh, the optimal transport reference about the sinkhorn. If you want to, okay, I highly recommend to read this book. Like, it's actually sinkhorn, just like a chapter five or chapter six of this book, you just read it, and it's amazing algorithm, like mathematically it's amazing, and the algorithm even, even more amazing than, like, than the math. So <laughs> how, how to do the, the algorithm is so simple and so effective. Actually, the original paper introduced the Sinkhorn, it's called light speed optimal transport calculation or something. It's like super fast and uh, make a total sense, and it's like a, Really amazing algorithm. Yeah, I highly recommend you read it. You can you can just find this. Uh, I, I think NYU uh, library have this uh, book for free. Yeah, you can find it. Okay, I think I, that's all the questions. I think okay, yeah, yeah, I saw this one. Oh, if a on projector on. remove a lot of information, why use it during training? Okay, okay, uh, again, it's uh, just an empirical result. We found out that if you use it during training, it actually works much better than not using it. So that's a that's actually in the original MoCo, they, do not, they didn't use a projector and the same clear user projector and the same clear outperform MoCo. The, the MoCo guy went back and they, they published like only two page paper called MoCo V2. The only difference is they add the projector and the boost up the performance. Yeah. So the expander serves the opposite purpose. Uh, actually, um, I think even you you think as a spender, you project a higher dimension. Actually, in some sense, it is still remove the information. So basically, it's still like a projector. I I do not know why. Like uh, even if it project higher dimensional, it uh, it still lost a lot of information. So I I have no explanation for that. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess that's all the question. Thank so, you, Justin, so much for yeah. teaching. Uh, I, I I didn't have to say anything. You are a completely self uh, self teaching yeah. machine, right? You're, you're I think I got used to this uh, chat because the last uh, class I it's uh, gave me a hard time to check this chat. Today you were yeah. just.
today you are just yeah. perfect i i have no 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 whatsoever yeah. other feedback so yeah. i hope you're gonna, we are gonna see jachen in the future uh, again depending if he has more things to say he always <laughs> has things to say so i believe we are gonna be seeing him yeah. in the near future yeah. uh, otherwise everyone enjoy the the end of the week yeah. and we'll see Wait, you. uh last comment about the, the project uh -huh. Sure. We're gonna release the detail about the project, how you can access the Google Cloud and everything tonight. So yeah, you will just wait my emails. All right, right, so you're gonna get an email from Justin tonight. Otherwise, yeah. enjoy the evening, the end of the week. And then I'll see you next week on Wednesday for the next lesson, okay? Bye-bye, mm -hmm. have a good night. Bye-bye.